Good morning and welcome. I am Rona Zlockauer, your moderator for today. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Manadnock Summer Lyceum with today's guest speaker, Rebecca Haynes. Before beginning, I'd like to thank today's musician, Eric Stumacher, for the lovely music you enjoyed while waiting for the live broadcast. Also, thank you to People's United Bank, Peterborough and Jaffrey Branches, for generously supporting today's event. For many years, the Monadnock Summer Lyceum has brought outstanding world-class speakers to the Monadnock region to serve as catalysts to inform, engage, and inspire an active citizenry on local, national, and global issues. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is supported primarily through contributions from our audience. We deeply appreciate your contributions which this year may be made on the Lyceum website or by mail. During this very challenging time, your help is needed more than ever. Today's talk is being recorded and will soon be available as a podcast and as a video at monadnocklyceum.org. The talk will also be rebroadcast on WSMN next Sunday at 11 a.m. and on WUML this coming Wednesday at 10 a.m. As is the tradition, after the presentation, our speaker will be available to answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions by using the comments section on Facebook or YouTube, or send them by email to monmonlyceum at gmail.com. After the broadcast, you may provide feedback on today's program, suggestions for next summer speakers, or join the mailing list through our website. Our speaker today, Dr. Rebecca Haynes, is a children's media culture expert. She is professor of media and communications at Salem State University in Salem, Mass. Her research focuses on media representation and identity. Rebecca is the author of The Princess Problem, guiding our girls through the princess obsessed years and growing up with girl power, girlhood on screen and in everyday life. She is the lead editor of the anthology cultural series of Lego, More Than Just Bricks. Rebecca has also frequently contributed to the Christian Science Monitor, the Washington Post, Boston Globe Magazine, NPR's On Point, BBC News. Previously, the assistant director of the Center for Childhood and Youth Studies and founding board member of Brave Girls Alliance, she has advocated for girls' empowerment and the improvement of girls' media and popular culture. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Rona, for that gracious introduction. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with you today. The question that I'm hoping to answer for you today is, does children's popular culture matter? Um, lots of people seem to believe that it isn't all that important. It's just entertainment, people say. Don't overthink it. And I get that a lot from people who are critical of the close inquiry that I engage in into children's popular culture. If that's your take, I understand. But today I'm going to present a counter perspective and argue why I believe it actually does matter. I'm going to discuss three big picture reasons why as follows. The first has to do with something called political economy, the ownership, capitalism, deregulation, and globalization of children's popular culture industries are significant and make them really powerful forces in our world. The second is that children's popular culture is a socializing force. Like other agents of socialization, such as parents, peers, education, religion, and so on, Children's media and toys are part of our society and they do teach children lessons about the world and their places in it. As adults, we shouldn't give these industries a free pass and turn a blind eye to their messaging. We should care about what those messages are. And the third point that I'll go into today is that children's pop culture really matters to kids. As anyone who's heard a child discuss their favorite TV show or video game or toy in great detail knows, children play, play close attention to the children's culture that these industries provide to them. It's important to honor and respect children's interests, not to shame or blame them, and to care about the things that they care about. Now, while this isn't a comprehensive list, Political economy, socialization, and children's perspectives are the three reasons I'll go into today. 
Then at the end, I'll share a few practical suggestions that parents, grandparents, and other adults who care for children can use to help the children in their lives understand and navigate the pop culture environment that they're growing up in, in a supportive, compassionate way. Okay, first, let's consider the political economy of the children's media and toy industries. This is the behind the scenes stuff that a lot of people really don't know about and that surprised me as I started really looking into it myself. We live in a capital society, in a capitalist society in which successful businesses have real political power. The children's media and toy industries are strongly interwoven and taken together, they do constitute quite a powerful force. I'm gonna start by talking about a couple of numbers and they're big numbers, so I ask you to bear with me. To begin, in 2019, the toy industry boasted global sales of $90.7 billion. For perspective, that number, $90.7 billion, is bigger than the gross domestic product of 124 of the 189 countries tracked by the World Bank. And the forecast for the toy market is quite strong. Business Wire notes that although, uh, actually no, Business Wire notes that the toys and games market is expected to grow by another 54.72 billion through 2024, just looking four years out. This means that the toy industry has immense resources and very, very deep pockets. In 2018 alone, they spent $4.2 billion worldwide to reach kids, and those expenditures continue to increase. Now, it's important to understand that those kinds of advertising expenditures really do influence media. You see, television and digital media are in the business of delivering viewers to advertisers. That's how the media make money. It's not from our cable bills. It's from charging companies for the ability to reach us. As I like to tell my college students at Salem State, from that vantage point, the products you see in commercials aren't really the product. We are the product being sold as audiences and target markets to major corporations for huge sums of money. We are worth so much. That means the children's toy industry and the children's media industry have a pretty symbiotic kind of relationship. Media outlets are most concerned with offering programming that will attract the kinds of child audiences that advertisers will pay big money to reach. This gives the toy industry a pretty outsized influence on what kids actually see on television. It also influences the content of newer digital media channels that are ad-driven like YouTube. There is so much money in reaching kids through YouTube and other channels that some independent kid-oriented YouTube channels and influencers enjoy success beyond your imagination. So much greater than you would think. To give one really strong example, the YouTube channel Ryan's World, which features a nine-year-old child influencer and has 25.1 million subscribers, earned about $26 million in 2019 alone and has been ranked as the top YouTube earner by Forbes for two years in a row. Many brands are seeking relationships with these kinds of successful channels and that influences their content and the types of things that they put on screen for our kids to see. Now, in thinking about the political economy of children's toys and media, their collective wealth and power and influence, it's important to bear in mind that these industries haven't always been like this. It's not some kind of naturally occurring phenomenon. We can look at the industry's history and understand how it took its present shape. So I'd like to just take you on a quick journey back through time and tell you the story of how we got to this point today. Prior to the 1950s, there existed neither brand name toys that children could request nor advertisements informing children of toys available for purchase. Instead, parents could inquire about age appropriate toys at local toy stores. But following the dawn of television and children's programming, toy manufacturers realized that they now had the ability to inform and persuade children directly without parents' mediation, and they mostly focused their advertising efforts around the holidays. Then in the mid 1950s, a young company called Mattel made television history by agreeing to sponsor Disney's The Mickey Mouse Club. And they advertised through that show to children year round, not just near Christmas. 
So when Mattel's Burp Gun, the first toy advertisement shown on screen in the family living room, sold a record-breaking 1 million units in a month's time due to their advertising. This opened the floodgates. It proved that coupling children's television and children's toy advertisements could be highly profitable indeed. Then throughout the 1960s and beyond, as children's allowances and their pocket money and their daily television viewing time rose, kids' value to marketers and advertisers continued to increase. Throughout this period, though, the Federal Communications Commission was concerned with protecting kids. They stated that broadcasters have a special obligation to serve the unique needs of children through their content. Therefore, the FCC oversaw limitations on advertising to children, preventing children from being, quote, barraged with potentially harmful propaganda and keeping networks from, quote, violating the trust of children by serving the financial interests of the station. But in the 1970s and 1980s, we saw a nationwide wave of deregulation in several industries in the U.S., and the U.S. media industry was caught up in this. The FCC ultimately deregulated children's television, lifting the ban on program length toy commercials in 1984. As the National Association of Broadcasters Vice President for Public Affairs explained around that time, the FCC got out of the regulation business entirely. You can run as many commercials as you want. You can run a 30 minute toy commercial if you want to. So companies were suddenly in the clear to produce children's television shows that had virtually no beneficial or pro-social qualities. Program length toy commercials like Strawberry Shortcake and My Little Pony and Pump Puppies and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and more were everywhere. Corporations' right to profit had superseded children's right to protection from commercial interests. In the same time period, widespread consumer adoption of cable greatly increased channel viewing options and networks dedicated to children only began to appear for the first time. The success of networks like Nickelodeon created room for new children's television shows and allowed media owners to target even more narrowly segmented audiences, making the child market more lucrative than ever. In any case, as the deregulation of television, uh, as a result of the deregulation of television, the success of toy-based children's television programs really changed what the industry looked like. The global TV brand licensing industry is now worth $191 billion. And while it's unclear what exactly percentage of that sum derives from programs and products for kids, it's clearly a significant figure. The revenue from merch merchandising and licensing agreements based on children's programming content was so immense that co-production cash and licensing revenue from toys and other related merchandise became considered absolutely essential to children's media. Before any new children's series or even a new series of an existing show would be greenlit for production, children's media properties basically have to prove that their properties are sufficiently toyetic. Um, now that means that generally speaking, children's media properties must have characteristics that make them marketable in toy form and other formats off screen to be considered for production. And the same has become true of the movie industry. For children's films, having toyetic properties and great merchandising potential is a prerequisite. This places a disproportionate obligation on child viewers to watch films that are essentially advertisements for products, because not every genre is appropriate for merchandising. Um, but big budget children's films really do bank on merchandising. And thanks to their merchandising potential, children's movies are so profitable that we're witnessing the production of an ever increasing number of films targeting children. Um, in 1995, only 18% of the US domestic box office were PG movies. Today, that number is 28% and growing. The Star Wars franchise is often considered to have set the precedent for toy marketing and merchandising, not box office gross, as a filmmaker's pathway to financial success. Star Wars has made billions in revenue from toys since 1977, and every time you see a Disney release a new Star Wars movie or other Star Wars property, I want you to think about the dollar signs that Disney executives are seeing in relation to the toys and other affiliated merchandise. They're really significant. For example, in 2015 alone, with the release of Star Wars The Force Awakens, they brought in $700 million in retail sales. And other franchises that continuously get re-upped 
are the ones that have also brought in billions of dollars in merchandise, like Disney's Toy Story and Disney's Cars films, both of which are total cash cows, reliably bringing in billions of dollars in retail sales. So in short, capitalism is the driving ideology of the children's toy and media industries. Given carte blanche by the US government to create and sell to children without regulation or oversight, the advice that children's toys and media are innocent fun that we shouldn't overthink becomes a little suspect. What if those industries benefit from the popular opinion that they're just innocent fun and we don't scrutinize them closely enough as, as a result? Here's just a really quick thought exercise for you. Imagine how different the children's pop culture landscape would look today if a set of values besides capitalism were the driving force in their production. Think about what's important to you, what you really value in life and what you want for the children in our world. In a different socio-political context, what other kinds of stories might we be seeing in children's media? For example, Many of us have nostalgia for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and the gentle approach that Fred Rogers took in his children's television work. But if today's marketplace logic had prevailed in the 1960s, his show probably would not have been greenlit. Think about how many other children's programs with a similar ethos could have been offered in recent decades but were never considered because they weren't toyetic enough, weren't a good enough source of merchandise. That can be hard to imagine in the abstract, but it is worth thinking about. Okay, so now that we've looked at the political economy of the children's culture industries, let's turn to my second reason why children's culture matters. And that reason is children's popular culture functions as a socializing force. As the social learning theory made famous by Albert Bandura suggests, when we watch things on screen, we learn. The media teach us about our culture's social norms, telling stories in which certain types of people and certain types of behavior are rewarded, while others, in contrast, are punished. These stories can help shape our personal goals and worldviews. Now, industries that have the type of economic and political power I just described definitely have the power to influence children's values and perspectives, and they know it. Consider, for example, that in the 1960s, a little bit of history again, Multinational U.S. corporations wanted to expand further into the global marketplace in pursuit of greater profits than they could make domestically. Through trial, error, and a lot of research, advertisers of adult-oriented products determined that the global marketplace was much more challenging than they had anticipated. To persuade adults in different countries and regions to purchase the same exact product really requires lots of different locally nuanced campaigns, and those are expensive and they cut into profit margins. Children, on the other hand, as Stephen Klein puts it in The Play of the Market, are socialized through, quote, the realm of play. Many brands became enamored with the concept of a common international youth consumer Essentially, the idea that kids are blank slates who can be targeted across global markets with a single campaign. If brands could market to kids internationally in this way, they would save time and money in compared to the advertising efforts that adult markets required, and that means more profit. Major brands, including McDonald's, Disney, and Star Wars, found major success with this strategy using what Stephen Klein calls universal themes for developing the youth market. This means that the children's popular culture industries are not just in the business of delivering child viewers to advertisers through the media and selling of toys to children. It's also in the business of socializing children to consume, of creating new consumers. As Italian theorist Roberta Sassatelli has noted, in today's world, quote, we are born to consume. Consumer culture produces consumers. Now, as contemporary children grow up in an increasingly commercialized consumer society laced with logos, brand names, and licensed products, kids do tend to favor mass-produced brand name toys and can be really attentive to those brand names. Studies find that even children from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds are well aware of brand names and engage in very complex decision-making as they juggle competing consumer needs like price, quality, and, and brand attributes. But Children's pop culture industries don't just socialize children into becoming consumers. They also socialize children in other ways along the way, teaching them additional cultural values and ideological perspectives. 
And these perspectives are not always in children's best interests or in the best interest of society at large, and they may run counter to children's own family's values. For me, two major areas of concern with children's popular culture are gender and race representation and the socialization into ideas about gender and race that happens. Um, in the context of social learning theory, the characters in children's popular culture serve as symbolic models with whom viewers might identify and from whom viewers learn through observation. Through patterns in mediated characters' representations, viewers learn about the statuses of boys, girls, men, women in society, and how these intersect with race and ethnicity. They also learn many implicit lessons about the possibilities and limitations that are culturally prescribed for people according to race, gender, and other variables. For example, gender stereotypes are widespread in children's toys and media, and this is what a lot of my work is focused on. Um, according to my colleague, sociologist Elizabeth Sweet, who has analyzed and decoded decades of children's product catalogs, Children's products, surprisingly, are actually more gender stereotypical now than they were in the 1950s. This is a pretty surprising factoid given that most people associate the 1950s with pre-feminist ideals such as gender segregated roles and restrictive prescribed behaviors for men versus women and boys versus girls. But that's the perspective that's being sold in many children's products today and it's reflected in children's advertising and toy marketing. Now, this gender stereotypical toy marketing really ramped up in the 1980s alongside deregulation of children's television. If we look back to the 1970s, some of you might remember, Lego was really known to be an inclusive brand where Lego bricks were there for all children to play well. Um, Lego's ad campaigns featured advertisements in which boys and girls were depicted playing side by side in very equal ways. They didn't place boys above girls. But in the 1980s, the deregulation of children's television and the rise of cable television paved the way for many new shows that targeted just boy viewers and just girl viewers, symbiotically catering to the toy industry's trend to market toys according to gender rather than theme or interest. So providing TV shows that were boys shows gave advertisers a place to advertise boys toys and likewise with girls shows and girls toys. And so in 1988, Lego decided to follow suit and go after the boy market to the exclusion of girls. The brand did so by debuting a Zack the Lego Maniac ad campaign in which it squarely positioned itself as a boy brand. And I explain this in more detail in the book, The Cultural Studies of Lego. Now, Lego so completely abandoned girls during this period that finally, a few years ago, they realized they were missing out on massive product uh, profits from the girl market. They could see how companies like Disney were doing with the princess line and the tremendous pro uh, profits they were enjoying. So Lego decided to create an entirely new line of Lego toys for girls called Lego Friends. So instead of working to invite girls to the existing offerings of the brand, they segregated them once again and said, okay, well, here are some Legos that are for girls. So separate but equal isn't necessarily you know, a, a great approach, but it does seem to dominate the children's culture industry. And the ripple effects of these changes are evident today. Um, now, once classically gender neutral toys are produced in boy and girl versions, such as radio flyer wagons, tinker toys, mega blocks, Fisher Price stacking rings, and everything in between come in pink washed versions, in addition to their primary color versions, in hopes that families with children of each sex will buy twice the toys. These patterns can cause girls and boys to stop playing together at a younger age than has been considered developmentally typical, and can cause boys and girls to believe in rigidly stereotyped gender roles that are actually pretty unhealthy. Um, it normalizes the idea that boys and girls are fundamentally different, and that kind of gender essentialism perpetuates inequality in our culture more broadly. Now, as far as gender stereotypes in children's media are concerned, specific stereotypes, um, my colleague Kira Hunting and I wrote about this for the second edition of a book called 20 Questions About Youth and the Media. For our chapter, we reviewed many studies about gender representation and gender roles in children's media, and a few key points are as follows. Um, 
For example, it is well established that children's media consistently overrepresent boys at a rate of two to one or more. In addition, they circulate stereotypes that are unhealthy and realistic, presenting masculinity and femininity as opposites, and not just as opposites, but presenting masculinity as inherently superior to femininity, which is not a great message for boys or girls to be receiving. One particularly concerning gender stereotype that children's popular culture communicates to all children, but that girls can really internalize, is the idea that to have value in our culture, girls must achieve and maintain a narrowly defined beauty ideal, which is presented as achievable, of course, through the purchase of many beauty industry commodities, which benefits advertisers. Um, in society at large, women and girls are subject to extremely narrowly defined standards of idealized Western feminine physical beauty, which is rooted in a white beauty ideal, P.S. Um, this involves light skin, long hair, a round face dominated by large eyes, a body that is extremely thin, and in the case of older adolescents and women, also curvaceous while being extremely thin. Think of the Barbie type. Many studies document that the idealized female body type is well below a typical healthy weight. Unfortunately, images of young women who meet this unhealthy ideal dominate the media, including children's media. And while in children's media, male characters are often presented as being both strong and attractive with those traits going together, boys don't get the same, it has to be this way messaging that girls get. The media present male characters sometimes is unattractive or not entirely attractive. Um, one study of children's media found that male characters with attractive bodies only had average faces and vice versa, while female characters generally met the ideal for both face and body all at once. So a much higher standard for girls than boys. Um, by normalizing and highlighting female characters' successful performance of extremely high beauty standards, the media teach children of both sexes that feminine beauty is compulsory, a prerequisite to make other traits like intelligence palatable. And storylines reinforce this by showing normatively beautiful girls and women reaping immense social rewards. One study found that 84% of children's animated films sampled associated a woman's good looks with her sociability, kindness, happiness, or success, and suggested that men love women primarily for their physical appearances, even though we all know that real life attraction is far more complex. These are the messages being delivered in children's media. For girls and women, pursuing physical beauty often feels more like a mandate than a suggestion and can really feel coercive. And girls internalize these ideals to a much greater degree than do boys. Um, girls have a higher degree of shame about their failure to meet these unrealistic beauty ideals. And girls who are socialized to internalize the ideal of extreme thinness risk body image problems, including eating disorders, especially if they internalized the ideal beauty before adolescence. Similar problems exist regarding race stereotyping and representation in children's commercials and children's television, as well as toys. Scholars have documented that children's television commercials convey an array of racial stereotypes and too often privilege white children's representation. White kids are often centered in ads, white, white versions of toys like the white Barbie might be at the center of an array of diverse Barbies, really putting white identity in this position of power and privilege that marginalizes other identities. Um, Children's television programs like, likewise feature problematic race representation and stereotyping. Just as gatekeepers seem to assume that boys don't want to watch a show or a movie in which a female character is the lead, they seem to believe that white children are less likely to watch a show featuring a lead character that is a person of color, as though the only variable that one would identify with is race or gender. It, it really doesn't make sense when there are so many other themes that can interest children that transcend those identity categories. Um, Stereotypes are also used in children's media and pop culture to categorize people into roles by race. Um, one example that I think back to because it came up as I was doing the research for my book, Growing Up With Girl Power, is the Spice Girls. And the Spice Girls was a pop music team that had several different members and each of which was called a spice. They each had a spice name. There was Baby Spice, 
there was sp posh spice, there was sporty spice, but the only black member of the group was dubbed scary spice and was made to dress in animal print clothing that sort of exoticized and othered her in a way that Jean Kilborn has called out in her analyses of gender stereotypes of women in advertising. Now, this really did bother the black girls who participated in my study. Some of them identified more with other Spice Girls and thought themselves more like Baby Spice, like liking cute things or posh Spice, liking fashion. But when they played with their peers on the playground and wanted to play Spice Girls, because they were black girls, they were made to play Scary Spice, even if they didn't want to. And it really bothered them that this was the only identity available to them in this pop act in their peers' estimation. It was very limiting and very problematic. Now, fortunately, some studies indicate that overt racism has decreased in children's programming over time and that various attributes of race representation have become more equal over time. Now, I'm not saying there are no problems left. There are still many, but it's hopeful that this is changing for the better. And I believe this may be driven by the fact that the percentage of the children in the U.S. who identify as being from a background other than white has been steadily decreasing. Um, I think I said that backwards. The, the percentage of children in the US who identify as being from a background other than white is steadily increasing. So we're seeing the so-called minority children growing in the US population. So by 2017, only 49.6% of children under the age of 10 were white, according to the US Census Bureau. Um, and this positions the US population to actually become minority white by 20. 45. So racial and ethnic inclusivity is becoming absolutely critically important for television programs and children's brands because the bottom line is that if they continue to privilege white children as consumers, their profits will decrease because the percentage of white children is going down over time. Now, interestingly, Mattel has been really on top of this lately with their Barbie line. Um, they launched a line called Fashionistas Barbies, which are very racially and ethnically diverse. They have so many skin tones and hair textures and their their work on race representation has actually been really impressive um, and senior vice president lisa mcknight told adweek that as of 2018 55 percent of all barbie dolls sold that year were diverse and the brand is quote focusing their efforts on diversity and inclusivity so really we are seeing signs of progress here but it's a complex situation. When it comes to representations of physical appearance in girls' media and toys, it's important to recognize that the stereotypical beauty ideal presented is still a white beauty ideal. The intersection of gender and race matters. And too often, children's media tokenize characters of color or place too great a burden of representation upon them. For example, consider the Disney princess brand. At present, the official princess lineup includes seven characters who are white and five who are not white. While this is progress, those numbers are starting to sound equal, it's, it's actually not equitable. Think about it this way. Girls who wish to identify with a white princess have seven different white characters with different personality traits, aspirations, interests, and storylines to consider. But the other five princesses are each the only one of their kind. There's one Native American, one Chinese, one Middle Eastern, one African American, and one Polynesian character. Each of these individual characters has a much greater burden of representation than do the white princesses. As the only one of their kind, they have this immense pressure to represent the whole of their group well and somehow be something for everyone in that group when really no one person or character can express the, the great diversity within any one identity group, right? So this does bring us back to a point relevant to the political economy of these companies. Who is running the major children's toy and media brands? If you take a look at their websites and check out their boards of directors and their executive leadership teams, you can see that most of the sites include not just these leaders' names and titles, but also their photographs. And while photographs don't necessarily tell us everything we could know about a person's identity, it is really clear at a glance that the leadership at these major multinational corporations simply is not very diverse. And we know from studies from the business world that leaders of corporations tend to replicate their own, their own worldviews in the products that they offer and in the people they hire. Without deliberate, careful efforts at diversification, 
too many structural obstacles prevent women and people of color from ascending to high ranking careers in these ind industries and taking on leadership roles. And companies that are not very diverse are going to continue to find it extremely challenging to handle diversity, equity, and inclusion well in their offerings. Okay, so having discussed the political economy of children's culture and explored issues related to socialization, including children's gender and race representation, I'd like to share my third reason why children's popular culture should matter to us as adults. And this is one that's a lot more fun. It's relatively simple. It's because it matters to kids. As someone who's been doing research in this area for almost 20 years now, I cannot overstate how much joy it brings to children to have adults take their interests seriously. When I go to a site to do research that's qualitative and conversational with little kids and share with them episodes of TV shows or Lego toys or ask them to bring things to me and talk about what they care about, they are so passionate and joy-filled and happy about so many of the things in their pop culture that having an adult say to them, you know, I know you know a lot about toys and media more than I do. Can you share with me some of the things that are really important to you? They, they love it and it's fascinating to see the things that they will come up with. Um, sometimes they, they surprise me when I, when I do research and come up with things that I would have never predicted. Um, for example, I think back to when I was doing research for my book, Growing Up With Girl Power, and we were watching girl power cartoons like the Powerpuff Girls and Kim Possible, um, Totally Spies, and a group of African-American girls I was working with in a predominantly African-American school kept talking to me about brats. And what I knew about brats was that the American Psychological Association had expressed concerns about brats dolls sexualizing girls because they wore very skimpy outfits and really were focused on appearance in a way that wasn't very healthy. And the girls wanted to watch Bratz cartoons. And I said to them, you know what? Okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll, I'll watch some Bratz cartoons with you, but why don't you bring your Bratz dolls from home to show me? Because I want to understand why you love these dolls so much. I, I, want, to, I want to know. I want to know why you love them. So they brought their dolls for show and tell to this after school group that I was running through their after school care program. And I was amazed because what really was the most salient feature of these dolls to these girls was not the way they dressed, but the racial diversity of the dolls. Bratz dolls, unlike Barbie at the time, came in quite an array of skin tones and hair textures. And the girls showed me how they played with these dolls to work out racism and race relations. Like they were playing together, modeling how things happened in the cafeteria at school. And then they even said, I'm gonna show you how black people and white people relate to each other yesterday and today and showed me how they would play slaves with their Bratz dolls. Like this was something that as adults, if you looked at these dolls, you would miss. You would not think children are using these toys to work out really critical issues in our society and understand and grapple with the lessons that they're learning about the, the poor placement of black people in US society and their marginalization and their subjugation. But these toys worked in a very different way than we expected. So while it's important to be concerned and interrogate children's media and popular culture, it is also important to respect that children have an expertise in their own right and what they bring to the toys may not always be what concerns us. It may be a little bit of both. It may be that they're completely ignoring the things that scream to us as adults as being problematic, or maybe they're just you know, viewing those in a secondary way. So basically, if we take all of these three points as a whole, right, what can we do with all this information with these three reasons why children's popular culture should matter to us as adults? Where do we go from here? Well, my best advice is this. If you can think critically about children's popular culture, you can teach children to think critically about popular culture too. The job, as I see it, is to raise media literate children. That is the big task for parents today. As I explain in my book, The Princess Problem, there are four steps to coaching your children to see pop culture through a critical lens and help them develop media literacy skills. So the four points are as follows. Step one, 
identify and communicate your family's values to your children. You can do this at any time, even while they're really young. If they're little, start simply and say something like this. In our family, we believe that all people are equally important, that boys and girls are just as important as one another, and that people with different skin colors are equally important to one another too. Our family believes in treating everyone fairly. And that's a conversation that doesn't need to happen in relation to media, right? You just want to make sure your kids know what your values are. Then you can help your child establish what I like to call a healthy media diet. I, I don't agree with the perspective that children should be completely restricted from engaging with media, saying no media for you is not a healthy pathway forward. So instead, work to develop a, a, an array of programming engagement, something that's well-rounded. Make sure there's content that does reflect your family's values in the mix. This can be as simple as saying to a young child that before they watch certain shows or play video games, you'd like to make sure they watch an educational or pro-social show first. And if you can honor their interests by helping them help you come up with a list of shows to watch first, that's even better. Say to them, hey, let's make a list of the shows that you're gonna watch first before you watch the other shows that you know I, I don't necessarily think are as healthy for you. Can you help me come up with a list? And, and they'll do that. And it's great when kids can feel some ownership in setting guidelines of that nature. Um, third step, watch and talk about media with your kids. Now, this is not something parents really want to do all the time. Um, a lot of kids' media can feel pretty inane and boring, and um, are, they're not written with adult viewers in mind and can be kind of hard to sit through and watch. But it's something that you should try to do at least some of the time. And when you do, you want to try to invite dialogue that is open-minded and respectful of children's perspectives. You can ask questions about what they think, non-judgmental questions like, what was your favorite part of that episode? Or what's your favorite part of that movie or video game? Or which characters did you like best? Establishing a pattern in which in your family it's normal to talk about media is really good. And also you can talk back to the screen in front of your kids to call out problematic things in the moment when they happen. So if you hear a gender stereotype or a race stereotype on screen, you can just talk back to the screen right in front of your child. I do this and my kids, you know, they, they seem to think it's normal now because that's just what mommy does. Mommy says, oh, I don't, I didn't like it when he said that. That wasn't right. Why did they say boys should be boys? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Um, last but not least, teach your children how media is created. Understanding that what is on screen didn't just magically or naturally appear there, that people have jobs and make decisions about who's on screen, what they look like, what they do, and what kinds of toys they think will make the most money can really be helpful. You know, kids have an, in, an innate sense of fairness and justice. So you can say things to them like, you know, Toy commercials just want to trick us into spending more money. And kids will say, oh, they're trying to trick us. And they'll, they'll pay attention to that and start to see it for what it is. Um, you can also ask questions you know, of whether your child thinks it's fair that a relatively small group of people gets to decide what most people in the country or even the world get to see on screen and what kinds of stories we see. Now, I, there are many more detailed suggestions on those steps in my book, The Princess Problem. Um, and though that book is written using girls' popular culture as a case study, it's full of principles that can apply to all children. So I would refer you there if you're looking for more concrete examples, steps, talking points in those areas. Um, but overall, I hope that I've succeeded in making the case that children's popular culture does matter. Um, I thank you so much for inviting me to visit with you today. And it's just truly an honor to be part of this lecture series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that very informative um, talk and uh, for um, why Children's Popular Culture Matters, the Politics of Children's Toys and Media. We have some excellent questions from the audience. So are you ready? Let's, let's, let's get started. Um, uh, you talked a lot about media literacy and um, people may wanna know where to go for resources. Uh, is there a New Hampshire resource that um, can help parents and professionals, educators and children? 
Yes, so as, as you know, um, there is a, a wonderful organization in New Hampshire called Media Power Youth, which works statewide to teach essential skills to empower safe media choices. Um, and they offer a range of parenting, school, and out of school and professional education programs. And, you know, it's, it's really wonderful to have a local organization like that in state doing this kind of important work because um, media literacy is something that many different states are trying to integrate into the K through 12 education systems, but it's something that's really happening piecemeal. So local organizations that help parents do some of this work, since it's not necessarily happening in school, are really, really important. And I, I would encourage everyone to reach out. Thank you. Um, you did talk about that, that we can't necessarily have children avoid media it's so ubiquitous, it's it's like the food we drink, the air we breathe, et cetera. Um, but is there a particular age that, that children can develop a healthy skepticism um, in order to question what they're seeing um, in, in brainwashing movies and commercials that may not be in their interests? You know, I don't know that there's been specific studies pinpointing an age and children are, are very different from one another, right? Like there's, they reach developmental milestones at different ages and, and stages sometimes. But I can say from personal experience raising kids that at about age four, um, I was able to help my children really have a little bit of skepticism about what was happening on screen and say, oh, those, there's a commercial trying to trick us into buying something. And, and I remember at one point when my son was maybe four or five, he said, mommy, this commercial is trying to trick us into buying things. And I was so proud. It was like this proud parenting media literacy moment. Um, but really, the answer is younger than you think. You know, kids, kids are smart and they listen. And when they're younger, they really identify with parents so much and want to do the things that parents do that having these chats with really little kids does pay off. Um, disordered eating and poor self-esteem and body image continue to be issues. Even, even today when um, we are doing so much more with women speaking out and protecting their bodies. Um, so um, as, as, as young girls consume so much media and privacy without adult mediation, how can parents and caretakers help with these issues? You know, what's sad is that I don't even know that the consuming media privately plays that big a role because the body image that is promoted by the media is consistent across adult and kids media. So even if they're, even if they're watching the news, what do, what do the news anchors look like? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's really not even just about the media. Kids get similar messaging at school. Um, it's really important to model as adult women, no negative body talk. I think modeling at home, maybe even making positive comments about your body. If you're a mom and you're looking in the mirror and your kids are right there, you can say, oh, I like the way I look today. <laughs> Do not say, oh, I gained a few pounds. Like, don't, don't say those things in earshot of your kids. There is data that um, what moms say, daughters internalize. And for dads, it's really important too, you know, Sometimes um, it feels like the right thing to do is compliment girls on their appearance, but focusing on appearance, like, yeah, it's kind of the low hanging fruit of compliments because our society is so clear that women's appearance and girls' appearances are important. But maybe talking about other things that matter would help kind of expand their vision of where they are seen as valuable or important, what's important about them to the people in their lives and society more broadly. So I, I, you know, really thinking about the talk at home and being really positive and really expansive can can help a lot. How is the um, children's television workshop doing in, in in terms of identity and gender? And you know, I I'm just always so amazed with the children's television workshop. You know, Sesame Street. Um, I think there's Sesame Workshop now. Actually, they've rebranded. They, mm -hmm. they do so much data driven um, programming where they really have teams that are looking at what is helpful to kids on screen. And I know that during this coronavirus pandemic, they were doing some work in that area even. Um, so that that is a wonderful resource. Of course, what's unfortunate is that because of some of these issues of the political economy of media, um, as some of you may know, 
Um, the new episodes of Sesame Street are now on HBO, which not all families have access to, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not as easy, it's not as publicly available anymore, and that's a great cause for concern. That said, the quality of the programming is still wonderful, um, and I, I do recommend them as a resource. Uh, another question, uh, what is the role of parents in children's culture? Uh, both programming and laws have tried to include parents in regulation. Has it worked? Are there ways for parents to advocate? And also we have, I'll conclude with that question, whether you're a parent of a child or you're a parent without children, what are ways that you can advocate and be involved in that regulation? Well, one thing that I think is a wonderful benefit of the social media environment that arose in the past you know, decade and a half is that we as parents and just everyday people now have these platforms that we can engage in to communicate with brands in a way that we never could before. Um, I think it's really telling that back as in, oh, I think it was maybe like 2008, um, in the marketing industry, they started talking about bloggers as brand assassins. They were afraid of the criticisms that were being posted online that they had no control over, that they couldn't mitigate in any way. And parents, if they see things that are of concern, can um, approach companies on their Twitter accounts and say, hey, how come you release this really stereotypical toy? They can start change dark petitions and get lots of parents to sign on. And I've seen some companies really respond to those because they say, whoa, all of a sudden, 200,000 people have signed this petition saying that our product is problematic. What are we going to do? That's bad PR. So they fix it, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's very interesting, too, that some of the changes in Mattel's Fashionistas line were really driven by what Mattel has credited to the values of millennial moms. They say millennial moms are so focused on social justice and buying responsibly that they felt that they had to create this more diverse line of Barbie dolls that in addition to the racial and ethnic diversity I mentioned, also does include more body shapes. So there's a, a curvy Barbie that P.S. is only about the equivalent of a U.S. size four, so she's only curvy <laughs> compared to like the size zero original Barbie, but still it's progress. Like, yes, more of that, please. But that really did come about because of feedback from parents and other critics. So um, L L L LGBTQ issues um, provide children with special challenges growing up. And certainly, um, they're not represented in necessarily in traditionally gendered um, roles. How, how is the research providing support to, to children with um, identity and gender issues? Well, what I should say, not issues, choices. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. You know, what's good is that we are starting to see more children's television programming um, address some of these identities in really compassionate, inclusive ways. Uh, my favorite example, there's actually a television show that I believe is available on Amazon Prime. I believe it's Prime and not, Net not Netflix. Um, it's out of Canada and it is called Androids, spelled with an E, because it's like the girl's name, Anne, A-N-N-E, Droids. Mm -hmm. And a major, major storyline is that this young girl, Anne, who is, by the way, defying gender stereotypes by being into STEM and developing robots, um, develops the like the world's first truly like self-identifying robot. And she she programs the robot to choose its own gender. And the robot decides not to have a gender and to just be themselves. And so the show has all these people interacting with these with this robot ranging from other kids to like a news broadcaster and they're all just so inclusive and supportive and they're modeling using pronouns that are chosen by another character, right? In this case a robot. Um, so there there are options out there. Um, not as many as, you know, one might hope to see yet, but I think people are aware. So we're seeing some progress in that area. Good. Um, what do you think of the uh, American, we have a, a, an audience member, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the American Girl doll series? Oh, you know, I think it's interesting that they were purchased by Mattel. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, Mattel and Disney kind of, use the same playbook where if they can't beat them, they buy them, right? So, you know, Disney couldn't capture the boy audience. So 
you know, to have something equal to Princess, they bought Marvel and Star Wars. <laughs> so with Mattel, you know, Barbie has had such a problematic reputation and American Girls has had such a wholesome reputation that they just bought that whole brand. And, um, you know, there, there are concerns about the way Mattel has been handling some of its expansions of that brand. So, for example, um, in a new book that I have been editing that should be out next year on children's toys and consumer culture, um, we have a contributor duo that really looked closely at how American Girl tried to expand into a boy doll, which was which happened a couple years ago. They introduced the first American Girl boy doll. His name was Logan. He was the drummer in a band that had a lead singer named Tenny that was the girl who had like the book series about her. How did that go over? <laughs> so they created this really um, macho masculine boy character that was oppositional to this like sweet kind girl character and it really was just replicating stereotypes and not the kind of thing that you'd want from the american girl brand so you know they had they it wasn't a success it didn't do that well there was a huge backlash from bloggers and moms and talk show hosts and um it was it was this controversy where they tried to expand this brand that was known for being girls first girl centered girl empowerment by introducing a male character that was honestly pretty rude to the female character whose books he was in. So they have a bit of work to do there. Yeah. So we have time for, for maybe one more question and um, a brief discussion. And given given the, the state, given what we're living through right now with COVID and, and the amount of stress that people have in their lives, the amount of time kids are spending on media because they can't do a lot else. Yep. Um, and um, parents are overwhelmed trying to keep their jobs if they still have jobs and do their laundry and do their grocery shopping and deal with other children. They, they were inundated before. Now they're really inundated. Yes. And um, you gave some practical media literacy lessons. But if, if somebody were to start tomorrow and take a baby step and maybe the next day another baby step, what might those baby steps be to help their kids consume media in a healthy way? Well, I think given the pandemic and the fact that many parents really do need their kids to be quiet and watch TV so they can work and keep their jobs, um, the most practical thing might actually be making making a list um, with, with a media diet or you know some kind of set of choices, right? I think if parents can help kids make good choices with what they're watching on screen, and not have to feel like they're monitoring constantly, that would be great. So what I would recommend is maybe the first baby step, sitting down with your kids and saying, okay, the kinds of TV shows that I want you to spend more time watching are the ones that have some educational component, right? That teach you things. And you might have to define this for younger kids. Um, let's, let's make a list. How about if for Every, like maybe your kid's obsessed with like Pokemon, which really like there's a million episodes of Pokemon. They could watch Pokemon all day and all night and nothing else. And they really wouldn't be getting any pro-social education content there, right? You say, okay, how about if for every episode of Pokemon you watch, I, I really want to see you watch an episode of one of these other shows. Let's come up with a list of the other shows together. And maybe also in that mix, it you know, Making a checklist that has things that aren't media, like saying, oh, really important. If it's a nice day, you need to go run around in the backyard if you're, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a backyard, right? Um, or, you know, you also video games are a big concern because kids can disappear into their rooms on video games or watching YouTube videos endlessly. There's no end to them, like one scroll to the next, to the next, to the next. Maybe say, you know what? Here, I bought you a timer. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let's set a limit on how much time you get and you can earn time on those things by doing these other things that are really important like reading or getting out in the backyard so little things like that can go a long way to diversifying what kids are doing in their time thank you thank you rebecca thank you so much for such an informative presentation and um i think that you've given people a lot to think about a lot to do and um, giving them the research. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, it's my pleasure. So um, Rebecca's books are available through the Toadstool Bookstore in Peterborough. Um, books get, will be delivered or mailed. 
And I wanted to update you on um, the Minadvac Lyceum programs uh, two weeks from today. Uh, there will not be a program next week, but two weeks from today will feature a, a collaboration of the Amos Fortune Forum, Electric Earth Concerts, and the Monadnock Lyceum. Um, and that will be uh, Friday, August 14th at 8 p.m. Um, Laura Putnam speaking about how women affect politics, the USA elections of 2018 and 2020. Um, also, um, that's again Friday, August 14th at 8 p.m. And Saturday, August 14th, 15th at 4 p.m., Marlissa Hudson, uh, EEC celebrates women composers in its cha cha changing the conversation series, Ladies on the Move. And then on Sunday, August 16th at 10:45, Susan Ware, uh, Why They Marched, celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. So a wonderful weekend celebrating 100 years of women's right to vote and a um, co wonderful collaboration of organizations. So um, thank you very, very much for joining in. Um, we hope you have enjoyed today's live broadcast. Um, we will see you in two weeks. Thank you again.